everybody. Hope you guys are having a good week so far. Sounds like you are. We're going to go ahead and get started. We are, of course, in Philippians chapter 1. And we're going to kind of pick up where we left off last week about verse 18. So as you get there, I, I was... Uh, you know, I, I I do I've done weddings. I do I do counseling before I do weddings, and you, and uh, I've, I've performed several wedding services and all those things in the years. And when you're when you're planning or you're counseling with someone, and you go through all the different things you'll go go through the some of the several weeks of counseling. But but inevitably, when you're getting to that point where you're actually planning the service itself, and not everyone's the same, but you know. A lot of times there's there's lots of moving pieces to a wedding ceremony it seems like sometimes there's you got people walking down the aisles and sometimes you got kids walking down the aisles and there's music playing and there's this there's timing issues you know there's all these different things and and so generally you know that that last night or two before the wedding you know the bride in particular is really getting kind of antsy about whether everything's gonna work and go smoothly and and the reality is almost every time at least something <laughs> goes just a little bit of right. It may not be a big thing, but there's always something. I just tell them to prepare for the idea that at some point, a flower girl or a bride, you know, something's not going to happen just exactly right. But I do make this promise. I'll say, I'll say this. Maybe the photographer messes up. Maybe the flower girl doesn't go where she's supposed to. Maybe the music isn't right. You know, maybe the food didn't work. But I, I guarantee you this. By the end of the time, You'll be married. <laughs> and that's actually the point of the day, right? And whatever else happens, at the end of the day, you're married. That's the whole goal. That's the point. Well, when we come to Philippians chapter 1 this, uh, this evening, um, there is in some respects, Paul's in this situation that it's almost like this is happening. He's got one overriding source of joy, goal and purpose he wants to see happen. And even if everything else in the day goes wrong, if that one thing happens, then we're okay. And of course, for Paul, that's going to be the proclamation of the gospel. And even if everything else doesn't go right, if that goes right, then Paul's, Paul's good. So we're going to begin this evening in um, Philippians chapter 1. Uh, I want to begin in verse 18. What, and only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and I in this rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me... To live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor, fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that's very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Now, we're probably not going to get through that entire passage this evening, but as we do, let's begin with some prayer, and then we'll jump in there at the last part of verse 18. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are grateful tonight for uh, the words that you inspired and led Paul to write down so long ago, and we are, of course, drawn to the joy and the energy in these words that we read tonight. Well, I pray that as we catch a glimpse into the things that motivated Paul and that brought him joy, that we would find ourselves drawn to those exact same things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, really, verse 18 is a transition, and it's one of those things, you know, that the, the, the chapter and verse markings, of course, come a thousand years after this, this letter was written. Uh, verse 18, really, uh, the... The, the phrase Christ is proclaimed and in this I rejoice is actually the end of a sentence. And yes, I will rejoice actually at the beginning of the next sentence. So yes, I will rejoice. Probably should be with verse 19 because that's actually where it goes as far as the thought 
So where's where we're going to begin? We're going to begin at the last portion of verse 18 with the yes, and now we rejoice for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers. We're going to begin there. Now, you know, Paul has been talking to us, uh, and we saw last week that he was going to be content and happy if the gospel was proclaimed, even if it was being proclaimed by people who didn't have the best motives. As long as the gospel was proclaimed and proclaimed accurately, Paul was like, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with whatever happens to me. And so he, he's been following that train of thought. But as we get into to 9 and verse 18, the, these, these, these last few verses have been talking about the situation that Paul is actually in right now. He's, he's, he's saying, yeah, I'm currently I'm, I'm attached to these Roman soldiers in jail, but they all, this is, he's describing what is going on, where he's at in Rome. But as we get to verse 18 and 19 and 4, he's going to be describing what he's looking forward to and what will be coming up. And we're going to find the source of joy is going to be the same regardless. But one reason that he can be so excited about what is coming up is we're going to go back to a crucial verse that really defines this whole chapter that we talked about a few weeks ago. And it's verse 6. For verse 6, he says, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. That thought, that idea, that, that foundational uh, concept that God always finishes what he starts, that security of the believer, that task that God's going to do, that assurance, that concept is what is behind everything that we're going to read tonight. Paul's beginning with that. Um, the idea of, of eternal security, or, you know, once saved, always saved. The idea that God finishes what he starts. That, the idea that the believer, that the genuine believer is secure in Christ and cannot lose his salvation. That concept is actually crucial for Paul. This is not just for us as Baptists and those who believe in this doctrine. That's not just a... A, a nice little side doctor that go, yeah, we, we believe that. That's cool. It makes us happy. The idea of eternal security, the idea of the security of the believer, that you are once in Christ, you will never be taken out of Christ, that's actually foundational to us. If we don't have that, then there is so much of the New Testament that just drops out and really means very little. Because every all these things are based on that idea. And so this whole section is based on that verse in verse, in verse 6. So Paul is saying this, in verse 18, Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know this. So now he's looking for something that's on the way. I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Now, when he says, this will turn out for my deliverance, what is the this? What's he talking about? What's the this he's talking about? Christ be proclaimed. Yeah, I mean, it's what we talked about last couple of weeks. It's all the stuff that's going on. So, you know, he has described for us, at least he summed up, and the Philippian church kind of knows the details. He summed up all the things that has happened and is going on. So he's saying this, everything from the house arrest, the the imprisonment, the accusations, the appeal to Rome, the shipwreck, the, 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 the soldiers being told the gospel, the gospel, all of it, the, the, whole, the whole kit and caboodle. All of it, that, that's the deal. So he's, he's just referring to everything that's going on, the current situation. He says, I, I will rejoice because I know that all of this stuff that's going on will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers, or you may have the word salvation there, and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So he's, he's talking about his entire, the entirety of his circumstances right now, the whole situation, will result, and actually the word deliverance there, you may have a little note, is, is actually the word salvation. Now, so when Paul is talking about that everything going on around him is going to result in his salvation, what's he talking about here? Is he saying that his imprisonment is going to result in him being saved? That doesn't really make sense, does it? Because we know that's not what Paul... So, what's Paul thinking here? 
what is his deliverance? What is his salvation in the context of what's going on? Okay. Okay. I do think that's one. I do think that is in fact one aspect of it. I think he can kind of have a double meaning here, and and I think you're right in the sense that um, so often throughout the scriptures, especially when we get to Revelation, but even a couple other places, we see salvation is not. It, it is a. It's a current. It's a present thing, right? I've, I've placed my faith in Christ. I am quote saved. I possess salvation. I possess eternal life. It's a now thing. I. It, it's a present thing. But is our salvation completed? Is it completed as of right now? No, it's not. My salvation will be completed when? When I see him face to face. At that point, it is, it's a done deal. I'm in the middle of I'm saved, but I'm also being saved all at the same time. And there will be a day when all that's going to be accomplished and, and when it's, it's that day I see him face to face. So right now I am both saved and I am also in the process of being saved. And then there'll be a day that I'll see him face to face and it, it, I'll be made perfectly holy and righteous and I'll be like him and see him face to face. And it's all done at that point. It's fully accomplished. So, yes, that, that's one way we can look at that too. But yeah, because we are obviously in, in being sanctified or being made holy, we are, the Lord is purifying us, preparing us for that meeting with him face to face. But it's also mostly just saying we haven't fully realized everything, all the benefits that come with being saved just yet. That's, that still is yet to come. As good as life may well be now, it's going to get better <laughs> when we see him face to face. So that, that's what we're talking about there. Um, so for Paul... Um, so I'm sorry. So one of the aspects of that completion, that day when we see him face to face, or that day if we're still here when he returns, whatever that end point is for us, there is part of salvation. This idea that's talked about from time to time. This idea that our faith is vindicated. That is, we will be proven correct. That all those who say. How can you believe in the resurrection? <laughs> there will be a day when, while it won't be the most pleasant thing for them, when they're going to realize, oh, they were right. <laughs> and that Christ will be vindicated, um, and, and we will be for having faith in him. This is actually one of the themes throughout the book of Revelation, is that the, the saints pray for and ask for that moment when their faith will be vindicated. Uh, Hebrew uh, P Peter talks about that in the, in the Look, in the letter of 1 Peter we saw, there's, there's going to be a moment show up that all the skeptics will go, oh, they were right. It's, just, it's called vindication. And so for Paul, as he has been accused of heresy or even blasphemy, blasphemy by, the, by the Jews in, in Jerusalem for his preaching of the gospel, and Paul's no, I'm preaching exactly what the Old Testament said we're going to preach. I'm, 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 I'm right in line with all this. And, of course, now, you know, he's appealed to the, to the Roman Caesar to enter, to enter into uh, get involved in this trial. Now, Caesar's not going to care one thing about the other, about Jewish theology. He's just going to determine whether Paul is actually guilty of anything against Rome. And Paul's looking at two things. One, he's looking at he will be vindicated truth-wise, salvation-wise, ultimately at the end. I think he's also saying... I anticipate once I have had my turn to state my case, I will be released, that he'll be vindicated, he'll be free, he'll be saved in that sense, that he'll be delivered. I think there's two aspects of it. He's talking about the ultimate end, of course, but he's also saying in the context of this whole thing, I've gone through all this stuff, and I am confident that when I go finish this process of this legal stuff even, I will be released. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life chained to a couple of Roman guards. I think all those things are probably um, happening here. And in this, he rejoices. Now, he says it will turn out for his salvation or his deliverance, and he gives two things. And they are 
closely connected in the Greek. They're, they're, just, they're almost not synonymous, but they're tied together with this conjunction. They're, supposed to be, they're not supposed to be separate things. They're really kind of, they travel together. He says, first of all, your prayers and essentially the provision of the Holy Spirit through Christ. He calls it, this time he calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Christ, but just another name for the Holy Spirit. So he says, these two things are going to, or what I'm basing my hope on that I'm going to be delivered. It is, one, your prayers, and two, the provision of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Spirit of Christ in the situation and in my life. So that brings up to me an interesting thing I want to talk about a little tonight. As Paul takes these two things and, and really meshes them together, is... Our prayers and the activity and the leadership and the direction and the presence of the Spirit of God. How do these two work? Where Paul could say, I'm going to put these two things together, and together they're going to be responsible for delivering me. Um, so let's talk about this. Why do we pray? What power is there in our prayers? Okay. Well, let, let, let me let me put it this way. Let me just start, let me just throw the throw the hand grenade out there. Okay. <laughs> See what happens here. Um, does God know what I need before I ask for it? Okay. Is um, is God sovereign in the sense that he's in control of all things anyway? Is God going to always accomplish his purposes and, 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 and goals? Okay, so why pray? <laughs> okay, that, that actually is, a, that, that's a valid reason, actually. <laughs> that's one that we're going. <laughs> okay. Well, whether I'm praying for myself or praying for someone else, and of course Paul has asked them and even thanked them for praying for him, and here he's clearly saying their prayers are playing a role in what's going to happen to him. And that's actually why he's very confident about what the future holds for him is partially because of their prayer. But someone might say, well, God's going to do what he's going to do through Paul regardless of what the Philippians pray, right? So why do they need to worry about praying? I'll let it whenever he just goes. Okay. So it's a demonstration of faith. It is. Absolutely. I mean, these two are, in fact, meshed together. They're almost like co-laborers here. Like, both of them are, are, are partially responsible. Um, I mean, he, we're, we're told to pray umpteen places, aren't we? I mean, we got everything like um, Romans 12, 12 says to be in constant prayer. 2 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Uh, Ephesians 6, 18, continue steadfastly in prayer. Four, Philippians 4, 6, pray at all times. Colossians 4, 2, uh, or, uh, uh, pray without ceasing. John 16, Jesus says, ask and you will receive. Uh, Luke 18, 1 tells us to not lose heart in prayer. And these are just, this is just a, a small sampling. We're told that the, uh, the prayers of a righteous man are effective. Um, so yeah, we're, we're told to do it. We're told that they're effective. We're told that they have a role to play. But it does, I mean, there is, to a certain degree, you're kind of going, wait a minute, well, God knows, I'm not telling God anything he doesn't already know when I pray, right? So some, let's be honest, some have asked the question through the years, why bother praying? Um, if, you, if God's going to do, if God's going to do what he's going to do, or if, what if, if uh, what if I pray and nothing happens? Does, does prayer actually change anything, or is, it, is this God going to do what he's going to do? I want to read this quote 
Uh, this is actually from R a guy named R.C. Sproul. We might ask, what if it, that being prayer, doesn't do anything? His response, that's not the issue. It's the wrong question. <laughs> Some, sometimes you ask the wrong question, you get the wrong answer. Regardless of whether we think prayer does any good, if God commands us to pray, we must pray. So that's, that's the first thing you just said. What is God told us to pray? In fact, he tells us to pray a lot, <laughs> doesn't he? And by the, many times he tells us to pray. I mean, from one end of the Bible to the other end of the Bible, praying is a constant command. So even if we didn't have anything else, if we had nothing else to go on, just the fact that God says, do this, <laughs> is probably a pretty good reason to, you know, do that. Uh, pray. Uh, no. So you're, you're right on where we're getting ready to go with this thing here. The question, what if I don't get what I want, or does God need me to tell him what, what's going on, or what if I don't get the answer I want? Looking at prayer in those terms, looking at prayer as, I want this, so I have to do this to get that. All that's doing is making prayer kind of a transactional thing, isn't it? Is that the point of prayer? To make a transaction. I got a request. I'm going to rub the lamp. I'm going to, you know, I got to jump through whatever hoops I got to jump through to get what I want. Is that the point of prayer? Yeah. 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 So prayer is not mostly just about me getting what I want. Okay. <laughs> now, he does tell us to cast our care. He, he tells us to ask. He tells us to do, I mean, he tells us to bring these things and to ask him to do this. And he does. Well, I can tell you guys are advanced prayers. <laughs> Uh, you guys, so yeah, if I'm looking at prayer in primarily the terms of, well, God already knows, or God's already going, to, he's already going to do this, or he's going to do this, or he's not going to do this, and I'm, so why bother praying? I have already missed the point of prayer, haven't I? Because even though we are, in fact, supposed to ask, and he tells us, ask for stuff. In fact, he even tells us in James, you don't have some stuff because you haven't been asking for it. You, you don't have because you haven't asked. That, he's telling us to ask. Ask and you shall receive. But, is there more to prayer than just asking for stuff? Well, what other things do we talk about? What, what other parts of prayer are there? Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Well, like Lord mentioned a while ago, this has to do with faith. It, it, faith prayer is an expression of faith. Because you don't ask somebody, you don't bring something to somebody if you don't think they can handle it or do something about it, right? Or if you don't trust their character enough to, to trust them with this particular issue. So prayer is an act of faith, even in the request thing, whether you get exactly what you want out of it or not. But there are, I mean, there's also, there's, there's worship, there's thanksgiving, there's the, the, the demonstration of faith. There's also things like confession and repentance. There's acknowledging the character of God. There's listening to his word. So there's, the, the reality is, 
if we see prayer only as, or even mostly as, simply, I want A, so I'm going to ask for it. I want B, I'm going to ask for that. And that's, I'm just going to sit down and wait for that. You know, God may, he may in fact give you an answer. He may in fact do what you've asked him to do. But if that's the limit to what we're thinking of as prayer, then we've missed almost all of the rest of prayer, haven't we? There's a lot more to it. Um, so yeah. Now that being said, Paul here says that he is he is hopeful about what's going to happen because of their prayers. And that goes even part to he thanked them earlier in the letter for their cooperation with the gospel. Remember that? And so their praying was part of that. That's part of their participation in the gospel is lifting up Paul. Now, I, 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 let's just imagine. Let's that, imagine we're in Philippi 2,000 years ago. And we all know Paul because he started the church. Maybe even several of us were came, came to faith under Paul's ministry there at Philippi. And we have been praying for Paul for the last several years as he has made his way under Roman custody uh, from Jerusalem to Antioch all the way to Rome. What have we been praying for on behalf of Paul? What, what, what might we have been praying for? Okay, maybe we've, been, maybe we've been praying for him to be released from custody. Probably, we probably have been. <laughs> now, has it happened yet? It's, it's probably been some years. I mean, Paul's, Paul spent several years in this condition, so it hasn't happened yet that we've been praying for his release. His effectiveness in what? Okay. It might be, and I know we've already, we've already talked about a lot of this, so we've already kind of burst this balloon, but it might be our temptation to think that when Paul's under arrest and jail, he can't share the gospel. That might be the world's approach to things. At least, we, at least we would say to ourselves, well, he won't have the mass audience. He can't just walk down to the streets of downtown Jerusalem or he can't just walk into Athens or he can't just walk into Corinth and just start preaching because he's chained to a couple of Roman guys. And we all think, because this is what Paul did when he came to Philippi, he needs to be someplace where he can speak publicly because, man, he's good at this. <laughs> so we're thinking we want Paul to be speaking publicly. So maybe we're praying for God to release him so that Paul can do that so that he can be more effective with the gospel. At the same time, what's Paul actually doing? He's sharing the gospel. And probably to people who wouldn't be showing up listening to him preach. Say, Roman soldiers. He does have a captive audience, yes. So, and, and this, of course, this is what Paul talked about. We, we looked at this last week. He's excited because he does, in fact, have this captive audience. He's got two soldiers to chain to him four hours at a time. And they can't go anywhere, so they're going to hear the gospel, probably repeatedly. And in fact, as those soldiers rotate through, as he, he probably has any number of soldiers coming through, they have all heard the gospel repeatedly. <laughs> and on top of that, everyone knows about Paul, and even the Christians who were there in Rome who were hearing and seeing and, and, and witnessing what Paul was doing, they've been emboldened to, in fact, go and share the gospel themselves because of what Paul's doing. So, as Philippian church, maybe they've been praying for his release, but it would appear they've also been praying for Paul to be effective in whatever circumstance he finds himself in. So that's part of their cooperation with Paul and the gospel. What else might they have been, I'm just, I know we're kind of imagining to a certain degree, what else might they have been praying for Paul? Okay, safety and well-being. He still needs to eat and not be sick and all those things, doesn't he? In fact, the Philippian church has even taken up money to help him pay for some of those things. That's that's the uh, Paphroditus showed up. That's why they were, he was there to help Paul with some expenses. Yeah. We, we would tend to think about, I mean, there are certain, I mean, 
when we read through scriptures, we read about guys getting depressed, whether it's David or Elijah or, you know, you know, Peter, whoever. Paul's one of those guys we tend to think about going, yeah, that guy never had a bad day. <laughs> but he did, didn't he? In fact, um, if you read the, the account of Paul in Corinth, it talks about, Paul says, I was, when I was there, he says this in 1 Corinthians in his letter. He says, when I came to you, I, was, I came in fear and trembling. He was having a bad time. He was lonely. And in fact, uh, in, in, in Acts, where it talks about Paul's ministry in Corinth, it even says at one point, the Lord had to come to him and tell him, don't be afraid. It's going to be okay. Paul was having some bad moments in, Phil, in, uh, in Corinth. He was he, like the rest of us. He needed to be encouraged, too. He needed a Barnabas to come alongside him and encourage him, remind him that there are people out there that love you and praying for you and are on your side. See, I, I would imagine all these things are being prayed for. They probably prayed for endurance. And that when, in fact, he finds himself before the emperor of Rome, that he'll have the exact words he needs to say. Um, so it, it, all those prayers are, are important. And they're important not just for Paul's sake, as the Philippian church prays these things for Paul, what's happening to the Philippian church as they pray? They're growing. They're coming to know God. It may well be that when they began to pray, they were convinced that the only way Paul could do what God called him to do would be for Paul to be released. Three years later, that hasn't happened. And maybe they've realized over the course of that time that Paul actually is doing exactly what God wanted him to do. Maybe their prayers changed as they learned more about the God that saved them um, and strengthened them. So if, if I'm asking the question, if God does everything, why pray? That's assuming a truth. That's assuming something about prayer that just simply isn't true. There's more to prayer than just that. There's all kinds of things that God's doing in our lives through prayer. Yes, we pray to God as a demonstration of faith. And Scripture seems to indicate repeatedly that our prayers are effective, that God does, in fact, act in response to and alongside our prayers. Now, does God need our prayers in order to act? Of course not. But here's the thing. God chooses to use our prayers as a means by which he's going to do some things. God doesn't need me to do anything. <laughs> God doesn't need any of us. He, God doesn't need First Baptist London to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. But what he has chosen to do is say, I may not need you, but I want to do this with you. If you, uh, you've been a parent, you've got kids, and you know, when, especially when your kids are little. Now, when they're teenagers, they don't want to do this. But when they're little, they like, they like to help you around the house. Or they want to help you with the chores. Now, it doesn't take long for them to get past that. <laughs> take out the trash. Come on. I have to do so much around here. But when they're little, they want to help out. And so you help them, you, you let them help out. Do you need them? Do you, do you need a six-year-old running around carrying stuff to help you do some jobs? No, if anything, it's kind of in the way. But you let them do that, right? Why? To grow them, let them learn, to let them be with you, and you be with them. Did you see what God's doing here when we pray? He's letting us tag along. doesn't need us but he says hey i got some chores let's come on let's, let's do some chores together <laughs> and we get to be part of what he's doing and if we're not doing that if we're not praying if we're not coming alongside him we're the ones missing out aren't we um, so this is this is part of what prayer um is doing and the truth is, God's sovereignty, his, 
his authority over all things, may in some sense mean he doesn't need me, but it's also what I do, in fact, need from him. If, if he's not sovereign, then my prayers are probably going nowhere. I, my prayers are dependent upon the fact that he is sovereign. They're dependent upon the fact that he can do all this stuff. If, he's, if he can't do it, then what's the point of me praying to him? You know, if, in, in that sense. So these two things are working together, the, the prayers and, of course, the, the direct provision of the Spirit. So both are there. God allows us to be part of this process. And so Paul looks at the prayers the Philippian church has already been offering up on his behalf. And he says, I know, I have a sense where this is heading. I, I believe, on one hand, my ultimate salvation rests in, in what the work of the Lord is going to do. And I'm going to see that happen, whether I live, you know, whether I live or die through the situation. But also, he said, I, I think he thinks that he's going to be delivered from this immediate circumstance. And part of the reason is because he knows the people have been praying for that. And he's got the, the work of the Spirit is involved, and he's seen all that. And so because of that, I know this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit, according to my earnest expectation and hope. And we've talked about hope, the biblical idea of hope, uh, before. I, I, I'm going to reemphasize it again. New Testament hope is not what we today would call wishful thinking. It's not... It's almost hard. To, we, we talk about hoping for something, you know. I hope Arkansas wins this weekend. Do I have an expectation of it? Mm. But for Paul, for the hope in the, in the New Testament is not kind of just it's like how they hoping something will happen because that's the way we use the word. For us, hoping something will happen means it may or may not. I don't really know if it will, but I'd like for it to. But in the New Testament, hope means I know this is going to happen. I don't know when and how, but it's going to happen. I know I have hope in Christ's return. I don't know when he's going to return. I don't know all the details of how it's going to look. I don't know exactly what my role or where I'll be when it takes place. I just know it's going to happen. That, that's, a, that's a Christian hope. That's a scriptural hope. So Paul's hope is that he will be delivered, that he will be uh, freed, that he will experience the work of God in this way. And his, he doesn't know how it's going to happen, doesn't know when it's going to happen, doesn't know the means by which it's going to happen, doesn't know what the circumstances will look like when it happens, or even where he'll be. He just knows it's going to happen at some point. So that's his hope. That's his expectation. And that he will not be put to shame in any way, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now that's a verse we probably all know. And what we're reminded here is this. Paul, as we see here, he wants Christ exalted, the gospel proclaimed, and if that happens, if it means him staying in prison, as long as that happens, that's okay. If he gets out and that happens, that's okay. In fact, whatever the circumstances are, through his death or through his life, as long as that goal of the gospel being proclaimed and Christ being exalted, as long as that happens, however it happens, yay. <laughs> now, I, I say that a little bit, but you know, I, I think we have to go, I think Paul would probably, you know, I, I know I have Paul, I'd probably rather it not include pain. <laughs> but, even if it does, if the result is the exaltation of Christ, okay. Because that is his goal. That that's, that's, that's what he lives for. But here's a question for you. What if we approach every situation Let's, 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 let's don't get too ambitious. Let's just say with tomorrow. What if tomorrow, Thursday, September 5th, right? What if tomorrow, when our, our feet hit the floor, our prayer is, whatever happens today, my goal is the exaltation of Christ and the proclamation of the gospel in whatever the circumstance is. So, when I go to work 
what's my agenda? What, what's as I as I go through my calendar on Thursday, if I go to work, if I'm going to Walmart, if I'm going to see the doctor, if I'm taking out the trash, whatever it is, whatever the circumstance, whether I get news I like or whether I get news I don't like, I want this event, I want this moment, I want that task to result in the exaltation of Christ. How would that shape our day tomorrow? We won't worry about it next week. Let's just worry about tomorrow. <laughs> this way, that's, we just, just got to get through it. We just got to get through a day of doing this, okay? So, uh, some of you are retired, some of you are working. So, you got different circumstances here. Um, for like me, you try to avoid going to Walmart at all possible, if at all possible. Um, but whatever tasks or whatever things you've got going on tomorrow, before you get into it, you're going, I want this task in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Whatever happens, it, whether it's personally beneficial, I think, or not, I want this to result in the proclamation of the gospel and the exaltation of Christ. If that happens today, then whatever else happens is okay. If that, if that happens. Just like the wedding example. Yeah, okay. Flower girl missed this. The pianist missed that. And the photographer didn't get that picture. But you got married. So that's what you, the, the main goal happened, right? So the main goal is the exaltation of Christ, the proclamation of gospel, everything else. As long as that happens, it's been a good day. Would that change? Would that alter how we see things throughout the day, even look back on the day, or even prepare for the day? This is where Paul's at. So there's a habit for us. Let's develop that habit. Um, that, that phrase there, Christ will even now is always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. That word exalted there, it actually has the, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it has the prefix mega. Mega is a, a Greek, it's a Greek prefix. That get, and guess what mega means? It, this, this phrase literally translated that Christ would be big in me. <laughs> his, life, his life would be big in mine. So there, there, there's a phrase for tomorrow. Pray that Christ is big in your life. He's big, he's, his picture is big in your flesh. So that, that's it. That, that Christ is mega tomorrow. In your life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, God has not necessarily called all of us to be Pauls in the sense that we are all called to go to a different culture and preach in public in different parts of the world. That's not what God has called all of us to do, but the exaltation of Christ is, in fact, what we're called to be. We're called as a church, as individuals. To magnify Christ. So, whether you're playing a round of golf tomorrow or you have a flat tire, how can Christ be magnified in that? Um, if we are, you know, Paul's very hopeful here in, in, in that, not a wishful thinking thing, but in a confident way. If we are lacking hope, if we're lacking that confidence and that surety of what God has promised, what in the end are we actually really doubting? I'm probably actually doubting God himself, aren't I? I'm doubting his promises or his assurances. Um, I wonder if one reason I might doubt or not have hope is because I'm really not hanging out with him enough. Um, I would think that the more I have interacted with the God of the universe through prayer, the, the more I know him, 
relationally speaking, I would think the more confidence I'm going to have in him. I'm wondering if sometimes when we doubt, sometimes when we begin to wonder, we, we sense a little hopelessness, it's because we're not really spending that much time with him. Another reason to pray, right? That's how we get to know him. All right. We'll move on, verse 21, 22. We'll move on with that next week. If you're watching online with us this evening, so grateful you're doing that. I hope you can make it with us in person the next Wednesday night or even this coming Sunday morning as we continue our study in Esther. If you're watching online, y'all have a great evening.